Well, thank you, Moaz. Thank you to SCTF for hosting this event. Um, thank you to all of you joining in person and online and, and to, to Omar as well. Um, the museum, of course, is a memorial um, and a, an educational institution that teaches about the horrors of the Holocaust. Um, I am representing the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, which is a part of the museum that focuses on modern day genocide prevention. So trying to do for communities at risk today what was not done for the, the Jews of Europe during and uh, uh, before and, and during the Holocaust. Uh, we were uh, honored and deeply moved when we first met I, SATF, when we first met Moaz, um, I wanna say back in 2014, um, with the, the, the Caesar images. And as you've seen in this video, as you're familiar with the Caesar files, we were struck by the power and just the, the sheer um, evidence of the mass atrocities happening in Syria. Uh, we thought that as the Holocaust Museum, we want to, to tell the story of other communities to make sure that people know that the communities are at risk today and that these crimes are not normal. These crimes should not be accepted. And so we uh, worked with, um, with partners to tell this story. And Mansoor, who you saw in the film, we created an exhibition called Syria, don't forget us. Um, taking kind of the the line from from Munster's, you know, cellmates as as he was leaving that you just saw in the film, uh, wa wanting to make sure that the world does not forget about people in detention in Syria, people there now, and people who have been disappeared over this this course of the conflict. Um, and so we told that story, but also trying to to, to cast um, a a broader light on crimes that that happen in darkness. Um, so we we showed in Mansoor and and the cloths and really have um, focused specifically on crimes that happen in detention. Um, there are many crimes that are happening in Syria today, as Moaz has described. There, are, you know, aerial bombardments. Um, civilians have been killed um, by the thousands. The besiegement of cities, and even now, when the conflict is not at the heights that, that it was a few years ago, that crimes continue, attacks continue, and detentions, disappearances, torture continues today. Um, so we want to remember what is happening um, and also show how, how we know about the crimes that are happening today. We know a lot about what is happening because of people like Mazen and, and Omar and defectors like Caesar or the grave digger people who tell us from, from the other side, you know, sharing, sharing evidence with, with the world about what has happened. Um, and we see this through, you know, so many cases and through the history of the Holocaust, in many cases, people are trying to get the word out about what is happening. And it's our responsibility to sh then share that information with the world and make sure that that information is, is acted upon. And I think the story of, of Mazen is, it's personal because Mo, yes, as, as you said, I mean, he is, he's a, a light. And um, I was talking to a colleague today and I told her about this event and the screening. And I said, you know, it's the, the third anniversary of, of Mazen's, you know, return and, and re-arrest in Syria. And she said, no, she said, I, I remember when he came here. I remember when he told his story to us. And she said, I, I can't believe that's that's how that story ended or or may have ended. Um, she said, I, I, I remember she started, you know, telling stories about what she remembered from from Mazen's visit. It was such a, a personal moment, I think, for so many of of people at, at the Holocaust Museum and certainly made all of us even more determined to continue to highlight the, the situation of, of detainees in Syria. And his story, the return and how dangerous it was for him also speaks volumes about just the danger to ordinary civilians in Syria today. Mazen was exceptional in many ways, um, but I think what happened to him shows what this regime is capable of. And for safe returns for the thousands of people, millions of people who have, who have fled Syria, um, that that kind of you know detention, disappearance, torture that still looms over so many people. So so safe returns aren't aren't possible for for so many. Um, and I just think it's it's fitting that we're here to remember um, the story and you remember um, a series disappeared. This this really uh, powerful moving film. And I think we owe it to to Mazen to to our friend. We owe it to the hundred of thousand people who have been disappeared in Syria to make sure that we don't forget, um, to make sure that we keep highlighting the crimes that are happening and making sure our leaders, so whether it's Omar yelling at the Security Council or whether it's us making sure our own leaders here in the United States continue to take these crimes seriously, I think that's that's incumbent upon all of us today. Thank you, Andrea. 
And Omar, you've, you've gotten to know Mazin. You've kind of lived a lot of the experiences of Mazin, whether it's the displacement part or the detention part. But um, please, I'll turn it over to you. Mazen Andrea, you know that I would have loved to spend all my time and effort to help the, the, the recent victims of the earthquake, but there are stories that we cannot forget. There are people that we cannot ignore. Uh, what's, what is happening in, in, in the north of Syria and the southern of Turkey is very important, but also what's happening today, now, at this moment, in Syrian political prisons, uh, is nothing we can ignore. Um, now it's midnight for me here um it's probably one two a.m um in two hours three hours in a prison like side now three hours from now the god will come and and call on you um to see how many dead bodies you have in your room uh, and then you have to pull out these dead bodies and then later you they will they will come and they the doctor will come and that doctor will say um who is sick and the one, if someone is new in prison, they would not know what that means. But the ones who said, I am sick, the doctor will come and kill them under torture. And the ones who've been there for a long time and seen other people die, they learn to say, we're not sick. we great. Nobody's great. Everybody's bones are almost broken and everybody is sick and ill. Mazin today is in, a, is in a miserable situation, something you could never imagine unless you experience that, that you don't need to experience it to empathize, to care, to do something. First time, um, and one of the very few times actually I met Mazen. I didn't meet him a lot, but when the time when you meet a, a person like Mazen, because he's extremely emotional, he's extremely human, uh, it feels like you met him so many times. I remember meeting him in Amsterdam, uh, where he was, uh, where was living, and uh, he's a very exciting person, you know, he's an excited person as well. So he, you know, speaks with his arms and everything and gets crazy, and then in a second from there, you will see him crying. And uh, he's crying that, that he has so much passion. He wants to change everything that's happening in Syria, bring freedom and democracy to Syria overnight. At the same time, he knows that's not going to happen. So he feels disappointed about it. And he does not, he, he lived in two fires at the same time. The fire that I have, the fire of, of passion and energy to actually change everything and the fire of the fact that it won't change today it won't change tomorrow it will take time and he didn't know if he would live until then so he was not stable in all ways we could say because he was suffering from what he went went through you know years of torture um, could at least leave you some ptsd uh, so definitely left that for mazin to deal with but also uh, a world that does not necessarily understand what mazin went through uh, a person who could not forget any uh, second of his story, who had to retell his story to a world that did not really absorb it the way it needed. For me, in order to tell my story, I had to adjust my story so many times for you. Uh, I had to work on it, tell you the soft parts of it, uh, try to understand how you think, how I can resonate with you uh, in order for me to to tell the story in a proper way for you to remember it for a long time. For Mazen, he wanted to tell the truth as it is, and it was too harsh, uh, too harsh for, for anyone to, to accept that the world is letting people die under torture, under severe torture uh, for a long time. The world letting one individual stay in power, Bashar al-Assad, despite the fact that this person is responsible for the killing of hundreds of thousand people and the torture. You know the ones who died? They died. We can't bring them back. We can ask only for, for justice. But there are ones who are under, you know, under the under the fear. You know, when when, when you can't sleep because um, you're hungry. Like I, I, I remember, and I imagine lived through the same thing. You can't sleep because you're hungry, because your brain is not allowing you to sleep because you're hungry. Not because there is no food. There is food outside of your cell. But the guard lets the food outside yourself so you can see it. But you can't eat it. It's also part of the torture. So today, when we sit here, we're not here to sit and be sad. We're not, sit he we're not here to sit and say, well, there's nothing we can do. This regime, regime is brutal. We're here to recognize that we have responsibility. And if, you, um, if you're here, if you're listening, if you're in the room or on Zoom, that means you feel sort of a responsibility to contribute to help other people, uh, people in a situation like Mazen. So how can you help? What can you do? Um, 
what can you do? There are, it's very easy to think that it's too complicated. It's very easy to think. It's major powers like China and Russia and the Syrian regime and Iran doing all of this. What can I do, a simple person studying at Georgetown University or sitting in Cairo or living in Stockholm or something? What can I do? You can do so much. You wouldn't even believe it. You wouldn't even understand how much power you have where you are. And exactly where you are plays a role in how much we can do. Are you in Washington, D.C.? Are you an American citizen that plays that, that, that gives you a specific function uh, that allows you to talk to your, um, you know, uh, congressmen, senators, and encourage them to take, uh, to put some statements on social media or to uh, draft a, a bill, a resolution to try to help Syria, uh, bring awareness about Mazen's story in particular or something. But you can also do something else. Uh, if you go to Georgetown University, you actually can advocate so the school puts a statement out in support of the political prisoners in Syria, especially Georgetown University that has an alumni from it, Austin Tice, who studied at Georgetown University, is in Syrian prisons being tortured today. Uh, and there's a, there's, there is a page, um, if you Google a Georgetown um, University web, website, but that's not enough. Having a page there, people don't go and search for that page. People don't get encouraged or empowered or awareness is not brought through that page. You need to put statements actively advocating for your student. That's yours. You you have the responsibility more than any other place in, in, in the country to do it. The most responsible institution should be Georgetown and the U.S. government. And then our work as Georgetown students to advocate for people like us in Thais, but also for me as a Syrian to advocate for Mazen al and to advocate for the ones I, I know and the ones I don't know in Syrian prisons because it's a place I can relate to. But also uh, you could be you could be one of the people joining us on Zoom could be a doctor and that doctor can actually try to help people on the ground. You don't, we not, not all of us need to actually help Mazen. We can't all specific, specifically work on one simple, difficult case. What we have to do is we have to divide our powers in a way to see where can I play an important role. I am a doctor. I can try to see if I can go to the north of Syria, actually try to help some injured survivors of the earthquake. Um, you may be a psychologist. You don't even need to travel somewhere. We can arrange Zoom calls between you and the people who actually been you know, suffering physically and mentally over the years, and now additionally because of the earthquake, you could, uh, you could also be, um, you could be an engineer who may spend, you know, an hour, a, a month, or a week, maybe, or something, to try to design something that can help these refugees on the ground. That could be, could be a smart vest in case they take them to the train sea to make it to Europe, or it could be a smart tent so people who lost everything they have, they can have a tent. Do not die under the snow today in the north of Syria, southern of Turkey. Um, but you also could be could be doing philosophy or writing or something and try to channel your talent and what you're doing into something good, uh, significant. Um, and if you, it's very interesting that in the last few days, um, for so many reasons, a lot of my friends telling me, uh, we're not watching the news anymore. It's so depressing. It's so bad. Well, the news are exactly very depressing when you do nothing about it if you watch the news and you sit home do nothing about it it's extremely depressing but if you watch the news and say oh there is this problem let me do something about it then you help someone then you don't feel depressed you feel joy well i watched the news i learned something and i helped someone thanks to the news in a way so let's not turn the news off uh, let's not unsubscribe from pages that share news about Syria. Let's not get tired because it's been going on for 12 years. If you get tired, you have to think about the person who was who in prison being tortured. Do you think that person get tired of being tortured? It's relative, right? So don't, don't get tired. I want you to, um, I want you to live your life, you know, enjoy your life. But, but I, I also want you to spend one minute, you know, a week doing something good, uh, doing something good to help the people on the ground, uh, whether that's a word you spread, um, or that could be an article you write, or again, a smart tent, or being a doctor, whatever 
whatever thing you, you you do actually can contribute to the to save these people's lives but also the most important thing you know is you need to follow the organizations that are doing significant work on the ground because those organizations won't be just being giving you the news of that massacres that will give you hope that will show you what you can do on the ground but also they'll give you guidance and everything you need like the syrian emergency task force or the white helmets or mulham team on the ground in syria they can show you uh, the hope that Syria has. They can show you a way you can contribute. They can show you beautiful stories. It could be beautiful stories pulled from under the rubbles. They can show you. So I want you to, to be an active member, especially if you uh, are a, a young person, a young person that's going to contribute to to the change that we hope to see in the world, in the future. Uh, if you're not following the news, if you're not learning about the stories of Mazen, if you're not learning the story of 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 this task force and other organizations you will grow up not knowing anything about the world you will grow up not able to create the change that the world needs uh, in order to have freedom in syria and freedom in every other place and democracy i'll defer back to you moaz thank <clears throat> thank you omar it's always inspiring to hear from omar and you know um i spoke to mazin's family after uh he was arrested again um we were discussing sort of like you know we want to help we want to know what to do at the same time Amazon had just taken just like an outsized role in media in different capitals in different communities people were asking you know what happened to Mazen and I wanted the permission from the family to be able to say what happened to Mazen Liz Sly of the Washington Post actually wrote a really fantastic article um that I encourage you all you know whoever's following us virtually and, and people here to look it up. But I think if you put Liz Sly, Mazin al-Hamada, it should come up. Um, and it's, it's powerful. But what was really powerful about talking to his family members was that, you know, right away they said, Mazin is not crazy. Mazin knows what he's doing. Yes, the regime may have tricked him, but Mazin at his, deep in his heart knows what he's doing. And Mazin has you know, we know as his family has committed his life to the freedom and democracy of Syria and to the cause of detainees. And so tell his story to the world. And for us as a family, we don't think that Mazin's going to make it out. We don't think that there's any way this regime, you know, may have not killed him this second or will. Um, but we do want, of course, we'd love to have our loved one home, but we do want the world to learn about the true nature of this regime. And this was coming at a time where you have the regime being received in capitals like Muscat and Oman, where you have, you know, the Jordanian king calling the Assad regime, where you have the UAE, uh, you know, welcoming them there, there or sending their foreign minister there, where we had at the time countries like Denmark that were discussing how the areas in Syria are now safe for refugees to return. So even the family kind of channeling Mazen were saying, use this, you know, use Mazen to, to show the world, to continue to show the world the truth. And that's how, you know, we, we needed that as we started sort of the Mazen campaign. In a way, every one of you should try to get any of your members of Congress or whoever to release statements saying Mazen should be released right now. That is arrest, because I think his story is, is, is really powerful. And we have a lot of footage and pictures and recordings of what Mazin has said and talked about. So you can almost get to know him virtually just through all the record that he's put out. And, and trust me, he would like consider each one of you watching this and here in person, you know, his brother and sister. Um, that's just the way that he is and encourage you to, to do all you can to help. I mean, the guy is literally under torture and refuses to get on in front of a TV screen and say, I said, it's okay even if it stopped his fingernails being pulled out. I mean, sadistic torture. And that is just brave. That is, that, is, that is wilder than any movie or novel we could write about. It's a real human being that has touched all of our lives so closely and touches anyone who gets to learn his, his story. One of the questions that have come in on, on the virtual um, chat was really answered in, in, in large part by Omar, which is how can we help? On Mazin's side, you can help individually on him. Ask us, reach out to sctf.ngo, go to our social media, 
We have a team dedicated in his friends, whether it's Sarah Afshar, whether it's Liz, like all these people that have been touched by his life, we have them on like a group on WhatsApp. And we're constantly thinking of how do we get, you know, different ways of pressuring, pushing forward on, on at least calling for Mazin's release. Maybe if more attention is paid to Mazin, there's slightly less even torture because this regime is a regime of cowards. Whenever the Caesar photos came out, um, actually, Omar, do you want to talk about that really quickly? Just what it means when you speak out publicly? Yes. Um, so take you back to the circumstances of these Syrian prisons. You are tortured. You are starved. Starvation is a very important part um, of, of the mental and physical torture you go through on a daily basis. They, 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 they care about starving you because if you're not starved, you think about something else. I think about freedom and then you may fight the guard, try to, to run out and so on. And, you know, for a long time in prison, I, 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 I wanted, I had a dream, a big dream. Uh, and that was to eat once, be full and die. Because I was, I, I could not stop thinking, imagining food. I, my brain was occupied by the thought of food. And um, at some point, suddenly, from nowhere, the guards brought us a lot of food. And you get it, you're afraid why are they bringing you some food. It seems like a trap. And you get that food and you don't dare to, dare to eat it. And then you eat it and the day after they bring you more food and the day after they bring you more food, you are afraid. This seems like the massacre is going to happen afterwards or something. Um, and then for a long time, we get a lot of food. And then suddenly they stopped. And that, at the, during that time, there was more food, less torture. We got more water than usual and so on. So it's luxury compared to the time before it and that stopped like weeks later stopped and they went back to even worse methods of torture and worse starvation and so on years passed and i made it out of prison i survived i get out and then i get curious about things about life among them why did not we get that much torture anymore and that that three four weeks um you know, period, why did we get more food? And I Googled the time, and that's the time when the Caesar photos were released. When the Caesar photos were released, there was a lot of media coverage about it. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was tweeting about it. The Congress and New York Times, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, uh, small, big newspaper, every individual, social media, Twitter, everybody was talking about the Caesar photos. Um, and that's this where the significance of your participation plays a very important role. Uh, when you posting something on social media or when the news is publishing something about political prisoners in Syria, what happens is the guards who are torturing other prisoners who are stealing the food, throwing it in the trash to not feed the prisoners, they start rethinking their actions and they say, oh, now a lot is happening outside. They may actually hold us accountable for our crimes. So let's maybe reduce our crimes for a second in case of anything happening. Uh, so what they do is they try to not be nicer, but reduce the amount of, 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 of crimes they are committing until they see if anything can happen after this wave of social media and news. So for three, four weeks, everybody was posting about it, but then it's a trend. You post and then oh, you get bored. You go and post about buying new shoes or whatever, something else. Um, so what happened is that after three, four weeks, nobody's posting, not even the media is talking about it anymore. So the guard is not afraid of it anymore. They come and they torture us again. They starve us again. So the power of social media is very, very, very significant. And don't undermine that. Absolutely. I want to check in real quick if there's any questions in the audience here and then we'll go back to virtual so uh, bahar's got a mic and we'll do one virtual one uh, physical question so we'll make sure to get to you guys um thank you very much for hosting this event um and for sharing all of your personal stories um i guess i wanted to go back to the question earlier about the earthquake and if we can sort of think strategically about what could we do really now to make use of this moment when there is more attention on both Syria and Turkey. Um, since you were just there recently, I'm wondering if you could even just share some of your, you know, insights from, from the situation there on the ground, because there have been some changes in terms of or more attention to what the regime is doing in terms of how they view the international aid, but also the border crossings between Syria and Turkey and also cross line between northeast Syria and northwest Syria. So I'm just wondering what 
possibilities there might be for more attention on this issue and also perhaps, you know, moving forward in some way to um, emphasize also the, you know, the commonality of the suffering of the Syrian people, whether it be in the Northeast or the Northwest and try to, you know, I don't want to say unify the Syrian opposition, but I think that's also something that, you know, has been an obstacle in the past, if we look at the past, you know, 12 years. So is there a possibility now for moving forward in a, in a more, per, you know, in a new direction? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I was in Syria, um, like three weeks ago, I was there visiting like a school for orphans called the Wisdom House, we support in, in situation is a war zone, right? They're getting bombed every once in a while, people are displaced, terrible, come back, here and then the earthquake hits and i i just couldn't believe like i mean how would that even look like so we return return back there and what was shocking is on the news initially you have everyone saying oh sanctions are preventing aid from reaching the victims of the earthquake relief sanctions off the Assad regime uh in order to reach these earthquake victims and that was the narrative that was really put out in a large part too by Russia and it's sort of, you know, different tentacles in terms of social media and other ways by Iran, by the Assad regime. And this was the conversation. What we did at the time is we wanted to just sort of highlight the facts. First of all, the epicenter of the earthquake, southern Turkey, and the most affected part of Syria, northwest Syria, were completely outside of regime control. He besieges and bombs these areas of Syria in the first place. And in the same breath that the regime is saying sanctions are preventing aid, planes were landing in Damascus. The UN Damascus office is operating, UN ISR, ICRC is operating there. So the first thing, and this is why it's so important to make sure that the true narrative is out there, right? The regime sitting with Mike Isakoff, as it says, oh, somebody photoshopped these photos. We have family members that, that know the loved ones in these photos. What was, what was really important to highlight and important now is something that has been always a question, which is cross-border aid into Northwest Syria and Northeast Syria into non-regime held areas of Syria. It continues to be under the command of the Assad regime in Russia. The United Nations sees them as the only ones that can allow that cross-border aid or not. I was there a few days after the earthquake, even going up into nine days, not a single thing came in through the United Nations, through paved open roads to the hardest hit locations. You could watch people sit by the rubble and listen to their loved ones scream and need to wait in line in a city to have one heavy machine that can move the rubble while they're digging with like shovels in their hands and then and then then you they stop pleading from under the rubble they stop screaming they die the Assad regime waited over a week before saying oh we'll open one border crossing for three months for now the regime is not stupid it's vindictive it waited for these people to die to even make an okay for three months on one extra border crossing. Mind you, these are border crossings not under his control whatsoever. I can take all of you. If you have aid, we could take it inside Syria and hand it out and come back out. Small organizations like, you know, in, in, in non-governmental organizations like the White Helmets, the Syrian American Medical Society, the Syrian Emergency Task Force, Communities in Arkansas brought in more aid into these areas than the United Nations has done. So one thing that needs to be settled is the cross-border aid. Strict humanitarian assistance does not need a Security Council Chapter 7 resolution to be implemented by the UN. We're talking about strict humanitarian assistance. Every border that is open with a paved road should be used to provide UN aid. The United States, one of the biggest, if not the biggest UN donor, this money ends up going and then not getting to those hardest hit, it goes to Damascus. I spoke to a friend in Jebele, one of the few places in regime held areas that was affected by the earthquake. And they're like, the aid isn't even getting here. The regime is notoriously known for stealing uh, this aid. And, 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 and you should see their statements, like Assad's statements in, in his UN representative. 
they're like beaming they're giddy about the earthquake um so one thing that needs to be settled is cross-border aid should not be questioned it should be indefinite for you for un aid and, and so on otherwise it should be done outside of the united nations if the un will continue to only give aid to the Assad regime to Bashar himself and to Russia it's just it doesn't make any, any sense um I think the fact that the Assad regime has also bombed these quake areas three times by our confirmed count where we know for a fact he he he, he bombed with heavy artillery after the earthquake should also be all over the news that should be a, a really important sign what's most dangerous is how some countries are using the earthquake to allow for the normalization of the Assad regime how the Assad regime is using it so the same guy who's saying no sanctions is blocking the aid from the northwest so these are some of the things that come to mind that should be settled number one ensuring no normalization and ensuring that this cross-border aid continues and ensuring that northeast and northwest syria all areas outside of Assad regime control should be contiguous there should be uh you know coordination and in, in support there and i want to turn it over to andrea just in terms of the earthquake and in light of her question if you'd like to add yeah, sure. And um, I can press touch on the, the question earlier about what what you can do, because I feel like that that's a natural question for so many to have. But I think supporting for the earthquake, supporting the groups who are delivering the aid is is really important. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are organizations who are meticulously documenting the crimes. Um, and these are organizations that are there, they get international support. Um, but ensuring that the you know U.S. continues to support uh, organizations who are doing the documentation work, who are continuing to work on accountability, that's really essential. That that has been been happening, but making sure that that doesn't drop off. And then on the issue of normalization, here in the U the U.S. is not normalizing relations with Assad. That's that's clear. Um, but they're also not pushing back on on others who are, and that seems like a, a reasonable request to make of of our leadership. You know, like it, I think the U.S. is is you know doing the right thing in terms of of not normalizing, but that's also a really low bar given the the level of the the criminality here. Um, so it, it could do more to to press others to to hold the line as well. That is absolutely right. And in the past, you know, under Republican and Democratic administrations, when when we saw this sort of normalization, the phone was picked up from State Department, statements were released, we reminded them of, of Caesar sanctions and other things, and that is a very important responsibility for the U.S. to do. I want to go quickly to a virtual question and then to an audience question, and I know we're a little bit over time, but, but I think these are all important. Um, uh just in terms of both the I'll, I'll i'll group a couple of these questions together one is about um the earthquake emergency sort of response and how to tackle misinformation uh, and also for those people okay um first of all um when it comes to the earthquake response um like i said un should be pressured to do more cross-border aid indefinitely but there are folks on the ground that are doing amazing work so the white helmets is a trustworthy you know organization that's helping get people from under the rubble um the syrian american medical society fo focusing on medicine our organization um we have been sending cash and aid regularly since the earthquake where we are just handing cash to families that have lost everything you know some of them just need to buy to buy food etc and then we're trying to bring in a as a matter of fact um Friday at 7 p.m at bus boys and poets for those that are here those virtually joining us that are in the DMV area please join us uh for a specific earthquake focused sort of update from the ground um as as well ways to help directly no overhead money and support goes directly inside um the the other question just so I don't forget um which was about how to tackle misinformation well we have the evidence and we have facts on our side we have the witnesses we have people on the ground we have documentation so even if it's a matter of pushing back against someone who's ignorant on social media or writing an op-ed in your local paper or pitching something on a national level or talking to your member of congress or calling out an outlet that has misinformation come to us you know consider yourself as part of our team all of our resources the people on the ground the videos the pictures whatever it is you're trying to highlight in terms of misinformation we're happy to work uh, with you on and that's setf.ngo 
Uh, I want to go back to an, an audience question here uh, for those. Hi, thank you so much for doing this and for the incredible, uh, you know, stories that you're bringing out. Uh, I'm a journalist with PBS News Hour, uh, but I'm also a journalist from India, and I've covered uh, protests uh, over recent years. And hundreds and hundreds of students and activists remain detained under false charges. Journalists are arrested, and there's a sense that nothing is really going to happen. We're at the very early stages of authoritarianism in India, but what happened in Syria, Syria uh, this, the sheer magnitude of it, as, as you know, St Stephen Rapp says, it's undeniable, the evidence is so solid, and yet earthquake is being used as an opportunity by the Assad regime. He's, his, his regime is giddy, and uh, uh, you know, earthquake diplomacy is an actual thing that's happening. You've touched upon it in your previous answer. Uh, a lot of countries are using this event, and Assad is using this event for normalization of ties. What can really be done about this at a time when the world, you know, commitments to human rights changes as per geopolitical alliances of the moment? And, and it's a great question. And I'll turn it over to Andrea and, and Omar if you guys want to uh, discuss it. Omar, please. Yeah, well, first, first, let me start by telling you that I, um, I believe that the United Nations is the biggest disappointment I know in the history of anything, you know. And the second thing is actually the U.S. policy on Syria is the second biggest disappointment I know. It's the worst. They have like no real policy on Syria that can make anyone proud to be American helping the Syrians. Unfortunately, what is the solution? Having you guys joining the State Department, change the policy of the State Department and change it. it sounds terrible. Uh, it's going to take so many years. So I, in a way, I am a little disappointed with so many institutions in this world. Um, and it's only individuals that are help, helping, you know. Um, so at some point, I, I don't want to, we don't want to shift our work from focusing on political work and governments and the UN. We're going to always try to engage with the UN to not give them a reason against that, against us to say, well, we didn't come to us. You, so we had to talk to the regime. Same thing to, to the United States. We keep close eye, we stay in touch all the time to not give them a reason to say we turn to the regime. And the United States didn't normalize the Assad regime, but allowing the regime to normalize with Oman and, and Jordan and Arab Emirates, which are American allies, is allowing normalization, is normalization with the Syrian regime. So what we should do, well, I will also touch base on the question of misinformation. Uh, the regime is taking advantage of the earthquake, and we have to take advantage of, of that as well. Uh, for example, we now have like more smooth access into Syria through the north. Multiple organizations could do that. We need to normalize that in order to always be able to, to bring aid into Syria when the UN sucks and when the UN cannot do it, uh, because they will go back to sucking again, not actually being able to deliver the aid inside Syria, because Russia will block that on the Security Council. Um, so it's very it's very important for us to uh, to normalize things that are not usually happening. Um, what we can do to actually bring um, bring an end to this misery is actually focusing on the populations of every country. We need to reach one of my mistakes. Let me tell you my mistake is I go and I criticize the United Arab Emirates for normalizing Assad, supporting Assad and killing people. I do not talk to the people of the United Arab Emirates. I only talk criticizing the government. That's a mistake. I should go first talk to the people, you know, reach out, say, hey, you, the great people of the United Arab Emirates, your government is doing something you wouldn't be proud of. And we want you to react about that same thing. Very often when we criticize, we just go criticizing the government and we usually say the name of the country. So people feel offended and not included. So they don't actually help from their own countries. So we need to reach out to the Americans um, more than reaching out to, to, to the American politicians at the Congress, because the Americans are the ones who can change uh, the, the actions of these politicians, force this politician to actually vote against, um, actively vote by taking actions against the normalization of the Assad regime or actually talking to the people in certain countries around the world that has that can actually change the decision making that's impacting this normalization with the Assad regime because normalizing Assad regime is is slowly happening with certain countries we don't want that to reach Europe 
uh, if that reaches Europe, because many European countries would love to do that because they want to get rid of refugees. You cannot get rid of your refugees. There is no way you can do that. If you normalize Assad regime, millions and millions will try to flee because normalizing Assad, giving the regime access to the north of Syria means you have 5 million people will flee Syria to go anywhere, even to hell, but not stay under their control of the regime. We talked about Mazen and the torture Mazen going through. Nobody want to live through that, even they risk their lives taking the rubber boat or so on. Uh, so we have to invest in the we have to invest in the people of every country, populations that are, they care, you know, you care. Politicians may care less because there's so much on their plate, but you care. You care to use your talent to help people on the ground, uh, your family. So when you go home, tell your family about what's going on uh, and don't assume that everybody knows what's going on in the world because it's not true. People don't know, you know. Uh, war has been going on for 12 years. A lot of people grow up with it. It's not even a thing. They don't think about it. Don't assume that the world knows. No, open this discussion. You know, it's I know it's not, not the sexiest conversation you can have in a party or in a, on a date or something. But you know, it, sometimes it, you can make it. it. Learn. You have to learn a good story. You know, it's a story of war, starvation, death, right? But there are very beautiful stories. If you, for example, learn to tell the story of the white helmets, then you will have a very good story to tell everywhere, even on a date, right? So. I, 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 can, I can easily uh, imagine telling you a fantastic story about, you know, the, the civil defense of Syria, people who suffered war, they've been bombed by the regime so many times, and today they dare to go to rescue the people under the earthquake, and the, under the rubble while the regime is bombing them at the same time, and then they're saving that cat, you know, and that baby, you know, that woman gave birth under the rubble, they saved the baby, it's, it's inspiring stories, you can tell it everywhere. So I want you to learn how to tell the story of Syria. Uh, so it's not depressing, so it's not painful. So people can learn it, remember it, and tell it to other ones. Go ahead, Moaz, I know you want to talk. And you know, we, we have a lot of questions that are coming in virtually. I know there have been some questions here as well, and I'm so sorry that we can't get to all of them. We're already running over time. I do want to just say um, very quickly that, you know, what you can do politically here in Washington and in terms of the UN, um, including, you know, putting your voice out there, the UN recently finally showed up nine days later or something into 10 days later into Syria. And one of the things they were like, hey, you know, stop criticizing us so much. And in a way, they were even saying, stop criticizing us or we would provide less funding as if any has come. That means criticize more. It means it's working um, and it's important. I respect the UN. I was in model UN when I was in like college and stuff. I, I want it to be what we idealize it and what we want it to be. Um, if you're into politics and government and, and talking to your representatives, reach out to us, join our family. We'll empower you with all the details to do so. If you're into making films or videos, we'll give you all the footage and connect you to people on the ground. If you like to write, you can write letters of hope that we'll take personally and hand over to people there. You can write an op-ed about what you're doing. If you're into home ec, you can make little felt teddy bears to children that have not seen anything but war and never gotten a toy. There are ways to help, uh, and we're happy to help you get there uh, and, and show you that each of you can make a really, really big difference. And the reason we're here, the reason some of you are on in person, I know some people at, uh, in Pittsburgh, as well, in sorry, in Pennsylvania, and those are virtually have learned more and learned more about Mazin in the war and will do something about it. The reason behind that is Mazin, even behind bars, even under torture, he's out there making a huge difference. And I'm so proud to 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 have to have to be his friend. Um, and so I want to just really thank everyone that put this together. Thank you all for your time. Really apologize for not getting to all the questions. I want to sincerely thank the, the Holocaust Museum and the Center for the Prevention of Genocide and you, Andrea, for just being with us through all these tragedies, but also the beautiful, hopeful stories in between that Omar tells us about and that we see every day. And I want to thank you, Omar, for being up so late uh, in doing this. And so um, please don't forget about this. Don't move on. Reach out to us. You can get to us on social media or on uh, uh, the, you know, the internet. Um, and please, you know, anything that you do for Mazin, anything that you do for Syria is also done uh, in the name and in the same spirit of these beautiful, amazing, resilient people like Mazin that continue to persevere. So thank you so much for your time.